Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel, back from a wonderful wedding on the Big Island. It was so grand. And I'm here to uh, enjoy my Tuesday with Sharon Moriwaki. Sharon is, uh, is an old friend of ThinkTech. Um, Sharon has been the co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, in fact, a founder of it. Um, and I have learned over the years so much with her because I've worked with her, gee whiz, a long time already on energy matters with the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And now it appears that Sharon is taking the plunge. She is uh, running for the state senate uh, for in the Senate District 12, and she joins us as a candidate to tell us about her candidacy. Uh, Sharon, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jay. It's nice being here again yeah, in a different role. These are your old stomping grounds <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah, my think old stomp, yeah. stomp, stomp ground. <laughs> <laughs> and we miss you, but you've been busy running for the busy, Senate. Busy, very busy. Yeah. It's been fun. It's so been why fun. did you do this thing? Why did you run? Well, for me, it all started with Kaka'ako, as you know from way back. Uh, five years ago, I thought there was nothing we could do about it. The buildings were going up. There was no green space. Uh, infrastructure was really a mess. And a small group of committed people can make a difference. At that time, the board was run by uh, a, a governor-run board of nine members, and we had no say in what happened to our community. But the small group of people, neighbors, got together, and uh, we were able to take on the governor change the law, be able to put uh, community people now, by law, on the board. And today, we have a board that really listens to people. Oh, that's great. You know, and that's the kind of government it's I so want. It's so important. We it need is. that so much in and Hawaii. In, in public policy, it's the people. It's all about people. Yes, so, I agree. So uh, I feel even more strongly, walking the district and listening to people, that it's a real disconnect these days. Yeah, well, you know, it's so true that that the government and people aren't connected the way they should be, the way they were back when. And uh, you're the kind of glue person who, who brings that connection back to us. And it's really wonderful to see you do that. But tell us about your experience walking, because I know you like to walk. And I it's do. not just for exercise, right? <laughs> I do. I've been, I've been really enjoying meeting with people. And there are some really good people out there with real problems. I mean, I, I take people who are too afraid to walk out at night, the kupuna. There are people who are afraid about their parks and their streets and the sidewalks being taken over by homeless. But people who are not taking care of the property, some of them are complaining. Small businesses, in fact, just yesterday I met a small business person who talked to her on the phone, and she said that the feces were all over her sidewall, and nobody's coming to clean it oh, up. Gee whiz. I mean, it's it's oh, that kind wow, of thing wow. happening in our community. It degrades and, yeah, everything, everything when that happens. Yeah. And and there's nobody doing anything. They call. They don't know who to call them for help, and they feel that their legislators should be there to do something. The administration should be there to do something. You know, never mind it's his problem or the city or the state. Make it's something happen. Everybody yeah. make it happen. Yeah. I'd want to do that. I yeah. think that yeah. it should be done. It's yeah. about time. Well, you certainly learned how to make things happen in the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. As a matter of fact, can we take a minute? Can you can you tell us about your career in the university, the Public Policy Center, and otherwise uh, that that where you can suggest to people that you know how to make things happen? Well, I think the main thing to me I look at is people, relationships, and, and, and making things happen for people. And at the university, when I first went there, uh, the, the concern was that we didn't have the university connecting with the community. So we formed the, uh, the Public Policy Center. And it went through a lot of iterations, because there's academe and getting to the community. Uh, and one of the, the big areas was, let, let's find themes that, that really mean something to people. At that point, if you remember, um, Hiko was having problems with 138KW building on the Wahila Ridge. So they gave the university some money, and they said, form a, a blue ribbon committee, white papers. Let's find out what it is that we can do to make things happen. It all started with that, and through that, over the years, I guess some 14, 15 years yeah, now, more, yeah. it's bringing adversary, adversaries together. It was an experiment in collaboration. So we had, you sit on it now, with, with we had uh, 
the utilities, we had the oil companies, we had renewable energy folks, we had the university, all coming together and saying, okay, let's step back and see what's good for Hawaii. And I think that's where it all starts, is, is coming with some mutual respect, mutual understanding, and really caring about the place we live. Yeah. And, and, and the experience of bringing together almost 50 stakeholders on a regular basis who don't necessarily agree with each other, whose business interests may be different, um, and who wrestle with difficult community and um, technological problems, and keeping them friends and having them agree on things, reach consensus, and actually do stuff. Mm -hmm. That's the remarkable thing, in my observation, about the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. You and Mike Hamnett have done really a remarkable job over these years. And I think, uh, if you, you know, maybe you're modest about this, but I think that really does qualify you for bringing stakeholders together in, in other contexts as well. And I think that, that as I worked over the years with different groups, different projects, from stream cleaning to citizen patrol to the Energy Policy Forum, or Kaka'ako and trying to get the community to understand it's really important to stand up for what's important for, for where we live. Uh, it's all about people, and they're good people in the community, all wanting to do good, and, and they just don't know how to come together to find a way to do it. So they need legislators who will welcome them. And listen to everybody. And, and, you know, it's not just who supports you. It's just everybody. Everybody has something to contribute. And you listen to everybody and say, okay, what's the best way for all of us to move forward? And that's what's lacking right now, I think. Uh, in, in that people don't feel they have a say, and so they give up. They don't vote. That's why we have such a low voting record. We've got, in my district, my district. Oh, this is Sharon's district. This is district. my district. Can we get a shot of that? <laughs> this, this show. So where does this district this go? Is, this is Kaka'ako, this is Makali Mo'ili'ili, Ili, and this is Waik Ala Moana, Waikiki. And so it's a diverse district. You've got the older district of Makali Mo'ili'ili Ili here, and you've got Waikiki, uh, here, which there are a lot of older residents uh, and some newer ones, but it's, it really is older residents. And then you've got the new Kaka'ako developing. Which and is huge and heavily. huge and high rise. Yeah. And, yeah. So, so when, when I talk to residents, they all are feeling that they haven't been able to know what's going on. I mean, even I started that way. We didn't even know what was happening in Kaka'ako until I read it in the paper. And it shouldn't be that way. It should be prior to anything coming in, whether it's a high rise or it's another establishment or it's Bicky Bikes. Hey, talk to the people first. This is coming, folks. How do you want it to come in? How do we want to, to be able to adjust to what your living style is like to keep the quality of life? We don't have that. Mm -hmm. It gets plopped in. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to me, that is the disconnect between people who are, who are paid, we're paying their salaries to represent us, and they're not hearing us or working for us. So you're going after the seat that has been occupied for this district by Brickwood Galateria. That's correct. Um, so uh, one thing that strikes me when you look at the map here is that uh, your district is on the water. It's on the water it's in Kaka'ako. It's all... It's all oh, shoreline and right, right through Waikiki. That's right. And we live in a time, and, and you're no stranger to this because you've been covering sustainability and uh, resilience for a long time through the Energy Policy Forum. Um, this, is, this is exposed. It's vulnerable. It's very You've been vulnerable. dealing with university people who study inundation, study coastal, coastal, uh, coastal shoreline management and, and, and risk. Um, so what can you do? What is your platform? What is your position on how to protect the, the property owners and businesses that are in that district along the water? Yeah? I think one thing, the first thing is awareness. People are in their cubicles not realizing sea level rise, not realizing that our whole district has a high water table. And it's been that way for a while, and that developers are developing on it without a long-range plan that we're sinking. I mean, I, I think over the next 20 years, I will have shoreline, shoreline, a shoreline unit. 
because the water would be have risen at that time. Right? <laughs> I'll just see right outside my be window right on the beach. The water. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's number one is awareness and, and people demanding that we do something about it, not 20 years from now and not, oh, climate change doesn't exist. It's here. It's here today. And we've we've talked to Chip Fletcher, and and we have the data. And Chip Fletcher is you know, the university, the university and so west, and west. He has studied he's, coastal erosion. And he's the one who and, showed us where my apartment unit is going to be. <laughs> yes. Right. And and so it's it's a reality, and and we have to plan for it. I believe in long range planning. I don't believe in just doing it for this session because it's a campaign year. I think it has to be that kind of plan forward. And, and the high rises are going up, all of these condos, they've got to put into impact fees that will sustain the shoreline and not just store it up after it, it occurs. It's planning ahead so that we don't plan too close to the shoreline. Now, despite uh, you know, the city's um, uh, project, which they recently got some federal funding for, um, to yeah. to build infrastructure yeah, in Waikiki. 500 resilient cities or something like yeah, that. Yeah, resilient yeah, cities, yeah. yeah. Um, to build infrastructure in Waikiki to deal with the possibility of uh, sea level rise. Um, you know, some people think that we haven't done enough. Uh, there are other cities along the shore, coastal cities, that have done much more, including New York City, for example, which is a, a much right. bigger project. Um, so what's your position on that? I mean, have we done enough, and how much more do we have to do, and when should we do it? I think we should have done it yesterday, quite frankly. And there's not enough money being put in. I, I think if you talk to uh, Ford Fujikami when he was with DOT, that, you know, all of the building that's so close to the shoreline, and we can see it at every big coastal, um, every storm, you see part of that shoreline being eroded. You do. And, it, and, and then, the, you know, you've got to move this, the, the highways in, inland. You've got to build to see the future that this is coming, you know, coming in. And you can't keep on building and building. You've got to plan forward. People don't realize yeah. that when you say infrastructure to protect the existing, um, you know, community, uh, you're talking about, A, a lot of money, and B, a lot of engineering in order to save the existing right. infrastructure, the existing buildings. Um, this means a lot of work. It means a lot of it's focus lot of and money. planning. It's it means a lot, a lot of, of action. It means a lot of money. But do you do it today or do you do it in the future when it's too late and you've got very little land left, you know? Yeah. I mean, look at Easter Island. It could be like Easter Island, you know? You just really you just let it go until it's too late. And yeah. we, we're, we're too precious a place yeah, we are. to do that. So uh, well, let's take a short break, Sharon. We'll come back. I'd like to get your, your views on other issues, uh, specifically affordable housing, housing in general, the homeless, uh, and dealing with the kupuna in our community. That's Sharon Moriwaki. Uh, she's running for the state senate, district, uh, senate yeah. district 12, which is on the map here. And we'll be right back for more of her platform positions uh, in this race. Hi, I'm Dave Stevens, the uh, host of Cyber Underground, uh, every Friday here at 1 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. And then every episode is uploaded to the Cyber Underground, that library of shows that you can see of mine on youtube.com. And uh, I hope you'll join us here every Friday. We have some topical discussions about why security matters and what could scare the absolute bejesus out of you if you just try to watch my show all the way through. Hope to see you next time on the Cyber Underground. Stay safe. If you're not in control of how you see yourself, then who is? Live above the influence. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host on ThinkTech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value, the accomplishments, and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Islands. Welcome back to Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Sharon Moriwaki, and she is running for the State Senate, State Senate District 12, uh, right now. And, and, and in fact, the, the race comes up for vote on August 11th. August it's not 11th. far away. 
And so this is uh, effectively you're running against another Democratic uh, candidate in a, in a Democratic primary, which will be determined August 11th. Correct. Exciting. Not much time left. Yeah. That's right. So you're getting support from the community, from I people. Am. What kind of support have you gotten, Sharon? Well, my, my, I'm really happy to have the uh, Hawaii State Teachers Association because the, the children are our future. So I have the HSTA endorsement. Uh, for our keiki, and I also have the endorsement of the Sierra Club and the Pono, Hawaii Pono Initiative as well, which, which is a group that's really concerned about the environment and have been fighting for the environment. So I'm really pleased with those two very important, I think, groups of people that, that really are our future. Yeah, and you've always been a, a voice in that community. You've spoken up for the community over the years without running for office. So this is a natural as I see it, anyway, a natural transition for you to move to running for elected office, and especially. Why the Senate, not the House, huh? Because the Senate is where we felt we weren't getting representation. Quite frankly, I would, I would ask for help from our senator, and um, it wasn't seen as, as something, I guess, enough, important enough that I didn't seem to represent enough of the community for anything to be done. So um, I think most of us felt that way. Mm -hmm. So we took it into our own hands. Mm -hmm. and yeah. we when you say it. us, you, you mean the the a neighbors. large group of people that you are acquainted with in, our, in the Kaka'ako and through the, the district. Area. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about your, your positions on other things. Uh, certainly, if I lived in Kaka'ako, I'd be concerned. concerned uh, I think Kaka'ako in general is concerned with housing, affordable housing. How do you develop this neighborhood properly? Um, it's a model for other neighborhoods to follow. It's a model for the future of Hawaii in many ways. So what's your, your view of housing and affordable housing, dealing with the homeless as well? I think that, that for affordable housing, Everybody's now realizing, which we've been saying for years, uh, is that housing is not affordable for our residents. And while they may say it's reserved housing in Kaka'ako, um, you know, 140 percent of the area median income is not affordable for those people who are at the 50 percent level or below. And, and that's a lot of people. That's half our population, 50 percent and below. And so we've been fighting for a lower uh, standard. Uh, the governor just signed off on Kaka'ako's reserved housing, supposedly for affordable housing rules, which I'm not so pleased with because it, it, it still is an average of 120 percent, not getting into the weeds, but it still isn't low enough. And it's for a 10-year term instead of a 30-year term or a permanent term. Because once you're putting affordable housing out there, you want to keep it in the pool. You for don't a want lifetime. people to flip it for, you know, right. investment Right. You don't want purposes. people making a profit on that's it after right. 10 years. And, and a lot of the luxury housing that's going up are being, are being um, marketed offshore. So you have offshore investors coming in and buying the property. And it's, it's taking out of the market, like the Airbnb problem, they're taking all this housing off the markets for our local people. And that's why we're suffering. And the homeless is just another you know, offshoot from the housing problem. Because if you have no housing for people who can't afford at least to buy a house or to rent a house, you're going to have people who don't have that kind of income who are off in the streets now. And, and so we've got to take care of the housing problem. That's key. You know, um, I always talk about um, the 50s and 60s when my uncle built our own house, my parents' house. And, and it was with a loan through Hula May financing, low interest loans. And when you talk to Peter Savio, who's one of the few developers who are building affordable housing because he wants to build affordable housing for residents. As such. You yeah. know, as such, not making a profit. He says you can even build for equity, you know, so that you help these people. You put a little amount into this, into a, a, from the mortgage or from the rent as, as you were paying mortgage, as if you were paying mortgage, so that you can have enough for a down payment that you buy your own house. Or you give low interest hula may type loans to anybody who has property, architects, contractors, carpenters, like my uncle was, and, and they have property, they can build on their property affordable housing for people who live here. And that's what we're lacking now. You know, the, the legislature touts that are coming up with 1,600 units of rentals. 
hey, we need 20,000 you know, units. So we've got to do something more, more. And um, I, I stole from, from um, um, Rick Blangiardi in one of his, his up, up, whatever, editorials. He says, we need thousands and thousands of houses. This is the biggest crisis the state has ever had. Why aren't we doing something? To me, we can do something. We've just got to bite the bullet and do something about it and put money there and get bonds and put it out to the banks to give the loans out to people to build housing for our residents. So I'm very, very passionate about that. I want to do something. Really, we need to do something and not just talk about it and not in an election year put well, a little money here. I, I, my view of it is this, this issue is eating the state. Uh, if there is no place for our own people to live, what then? Then, you know, you have disparity of income, you have homelessness, you have all, all kinds of unrest, and, you, you know, you're cutting the future right. off because people, if they can't find housing, they're going to leave right. town. Their right. children aren't going to hang the good around. people are leaving. And, you know, they, they, they tout rentals. I, I believe, yeah, sure, rentals. But rentals are also not stabilizing our community. You rent, your, your salary goes up, your rent goes up. So you have very little discretionary income to want to keep it up, and then you may be off the streets when that, that rent goes up. I mean, that's what happened to my grad sure. student, you know? So, so what you need is some way that you can rent to, to own, and, and some way that the government should be helping in that so that you stabilize, you keep good people here, you stabilize the community. Yeah, if you take, if you take all of the land in Hawaii and put it into um, a tourist destination, high price condominiums, and you, you don't no make community. housing for the local people, you can imagine what's gonna happen here. Right. Somebody has to attend to that, and I, if you're saying that nobody has, I certainly agree. It, we have not attended to this issue, and I, I sure hope you can do something about that, Sharon. It's critical to the future of the state. I believe so. Let's talk about the Kupuna. What's your view of the Kupuna issue? So, so I, I've talked to a lot of Kupuna, and they are struggling. They are struggling. And to stay in their own homes, um, to keep up their own homes, some, you know, to renovate their homes, but also they're afraid to walk out at night. And, and some, like I called this one woman, and she, she, she has her long-term care insurance, but she didn't know who to call, how to get help. She's, she's as Parkinson's, her husband is, this is hard of hearing. They don't have that kind of help. We used to be able to have uh, information referral. I understand there is with the Waikiki Community Center. We should have more of that to go out and help them. We have a Kupuna Caregivers Program. The, the legislators brag that they put $1.2 million into it for our Kupuna Caregivers. Well, do you know how much that serves? That's 330 people. You know how many thousands <laughs> need to be served? It's a drop in the you bucket. Know? It's a drop in the bucket. And not only that, it was $70 a day they were giving these caregivers. Well, it's $70 a week because they want to spread it around. What, what does that buy? So, so you have to be honest about it. You have to put your money there, because we should honor our kupuna. We should really care for them. And I really believe that the only way to do it is, is putting the money, working with caseworkers in the various communities that they know, the, and the kupuna know where to call and can get help. And we need to put the money there. We really do need to support our community. We have to take care of them. You know, in the old days, this was more purely a, a state of immigrants. It you was know. You know, structured yep. families, uh, families that were so close. Now, and, par and partly because of the housing problem, it's too expensive, and uh, people cannot uh, take care of their, their kupuna the same way, and, and the kupuna are being yes. marginalized, yes. and yes. We, have to take, we have to collectively take care of them. So that's a big plank for it you, is. eh? It is. It is a big plank. I, I even met one homeless man, because I was sign waving, and he said, you know, he says, oh, you've got to take care of the elderly. And I said, yeah. I said, so, so what, what's, what's your situation? He said, oh, my kids, they all live, oh, they're having a hard time. They cannot take care of me. So he's walking the streets. That shouldn't be. That should not be, right? Yeah. There must be facilities for them. Yeah. And through your district, especially. It's in the, it's in the urban facilities. areas. It's in the urban areas, yeah. really, that we need to work on. Okay, what else are you uh, seeking? What else do you want to change? What else will you do uh, as elected into office? You know, as, as I talk to people, they're very disenchanted with government. 
I think that's why my district has 20,000 registered voters and only 7,800 voted in the last primary election. That's just too low, and people feel disconnected. They feel it doesn't matter. It does matter. And, and I hope that people will feel that if we give people choice, if we give them accountability of, and performance of people in office, that they will be much more vigilant, they'll be much more aware of what's happening, of things that matter, and that they'll vote and, and speak up, because people do matter. It's not the money. It's not, oh, because, oh, they already got the funding. Oh, they've, they've got all these people. The big boys are helping them, and blah, blah, blah. No, that's not right. Every single vote counts, and people have to remember that. So for me, I'm trying to tell people that you've got a choice. If you don't like me, you would vote me out. If you pay my salary and I'm not performing for you, you would t t teach me how to do it right, or you'd say bye-bye. Right? You have a choice, and, and people are forgetting that they're in the driver's seat, not the elected officials. And they have to remember that and see what has been done. What have you uh, done for me today? But in the long run, what have you done in the past 10 years that you've been in office? So you've had, you've had issues. You've had concerns about the community for a long time. Um, and it sort of bubbled up here, didn't it? And all of a sudden, you know, you're an altruist and you're, you're an outreach person. I, I'm talking about the Energy Policy Forum. Uh, you didn't wait for them to come to you. You went to them. You know, come on, you guys, let's get involved. And I, I suspect you would take the same view of dealing with voters. Come on, you guys, come on, get engaged with the government, get engaged with my office, get engaged with the issues, and certainly vote, participate, speak up, all that. This is what you did in the Energy Policy Forum. Um, so, and, and it was totally altruistic, really. You're not in to make a lot of money. You're not in to stay in for a career. No. You just, you know, you just need to express yourself on all of these issues that you've been, you know, watching and saving up all yeah. these years, you know. So uh, what what does the rest of the um, the time look like between now and August 11th? You, you've been sending out flyers. Here's some of the flyers. It looks like you're sending out a lot of flyers now. I sent out a lot of flyers. <laughs> because, well, okay, let me tell you. This is a 70% condo-dense district. I walked whatever I could walk, and that's not much. And it's mostly in the older district of Makalimo Ili Ili. The rest are in condos. There's no way you can get into condos, except if you know somebody in the district, I mean, in the it's condo. Hard, yeah. Hard. Hard. The only way you can go into a, a person and, and talk to them is when they come to you. So I've been sending many flyers like this. This is for Waikiki. This is uh, the one for Makalimo Ili Ili. And this one is. Um, Oh, this one is for Kalimo Ili Ili, and this one is for Kaka'ako. So, so uh, this is the only way that I know of getting my message out and letting people know who I am. Um, and other than sign waving, and now if you look at our signs, we have messages on the sign, like endorsed by the Sierra Club or endorsed by HSTA for the Keiki. I'm for parks and oceans. Uh, you know, things like that that represent my platform and what I want to do. Um, I, and then one is, that I carry all the time is um, I will speak, I'll be your voice in the Senate. And that's how I feel, is that it's not about me, it's about us. And I really, really feel that way, that it's not about me. People ask me, all right, when you get in, are you going to just forget us, like, you know? <laughs> a lot of legislators you know? do just that, you know. And I said, no. I said, I'm going to come back, and I'll make you work. You're going to have to tell me, <laughs> what are the problems? What are the solutions? Not just problems, but solutions. <laughs> Well, that's what you've been doing with the Energy Policy Forum. <laughs> there are 50 stakeholders. You've got them all working. <laughs> Sharon Moriwaki, running for the state senate in the Senate District 12, which is uh, Waikiki through Kaka'ako and Boya Ely. Thank you so much for coming down. Okay. Nice Aloha. to be here again, Jay. <laughs>